Okay. So let's move on to labrum and FAI, uh, staying on the hip. Uh, okay, here we go. Robert, what do you think of this case? Patient uh, has so. right hip pain. Okay. So looking at the uh, right hip, it looks like there's some acetabular undercoverage and um, right. uh, protuberance there at the uh, lateral femoral head neck junction. Here. Uh, probably a little bit increased clear space medially than there is on the opposite side. Good. And then here on the frog leg views, we can again see that there's under coverage on the right side. The mm -hmm. CT scan confirms that, mm -hmm. as you're saying there. And uh, this is kind of what a normal labrum looks like. And this is uh, actually uh, a torn labrum. I, uh, Okay, so let's go on and talk about labral tears. And we can use regular MR, MR imaging or MR arthrography. Some of these cases are going to be old cases uh, that you see where, the, where we come over the years. Uh, here's an old case showing a labral tear here in this location. Uh, the imaging now we have is much better. Here are some early arthrograms. Uh, where you can see the arth arthrographic material inside the joint space and a normal superior labrum here. Uh, <clears throat> uh, this is this is actually from a textbook, uh, or actually from a uh, journal article. Uh, there are a number of uh, normal variants that involve the labrum <laughs> that you need to be aware of. One of them here is posteriorly, where you can see that there is a <laughs> labral <coughs> bone uh, defect here with contrast extending into the defect. When this patient went to uh, surgery, this was thought to be a normal chondrolabral uh, separation uh, in, in this particular location. It's nice and smooth, does not look like any trauma occurred in this location, and this is considered a normal uh, uh, posterior sulcus. Okay, uh, Tayson, what do you think of this case? All right, looks like we have a tear of that superior labrum right at the yeah. chondrolabral junction. So here we can see the contrast on this arthrogram extending there, kind of an odd a shape to that uh, to, to that superior labrum. Uh, <clears throat> here they actually did arthroscopy, and we could see the arthroscope there, a lot of irregularity here. That's another similar type case. Uh, where we can see the contrast going between the the labrum and the uh, the bone, uh, <clears throat> and uh, this patient had cam type FAI also. We can see the contrast extending deep there, a lot of some irregularity there. So uh, both of these, however, were thought at the time of surgery uh, to represent uh, normal variants in both of these patients. So you have to be a little bit uh, careful because it's thought that there's sublabral sulci, which is a separation between the labrum and the cartilage, uh, can be seen in about a quarter of the a fifth to a quarter of the normal population. Commonly seen really posteriorly and anteriorly, and super, but you can also see it not uncommonly superiorly. Uh, posterior and inferiorly, often it can go what looks like all the way through, though you, you don't you should not see extravasation of contrast outside of the joint space uh, if it's a normal uh, sulcus. Uh, superiorly, where we do commonly see them, uh, you it's usually not complete. It's usually a little bit of collection of either fluid on the non-arthrographic study or a contrast. Uh, at the chondrolabral junction of the superior labrum, but it doesn't really extend very, very deeply. You should have a smooth contour, limited depth, as I just said, and lack of secondary abnormalities such as chondral damage and paralabral cysts. If you see a paralabral cyst in that location, then it's almost certainly going to be abnormal. Uh, but but these, these can be a problem and difficult, and so typically... Uh, well, I think I'll show some examples as we go through more cases. If it's nice and smooth, and I think that it's most likely going to be a congenital chondrolabral 
defect or sublabel sulcus, then I'll just describe that, uh, uh, but but say, but I but I use they say that uh, uh, in, in the report that this is thought to be a normal chondrolabral congenital defect, though a tear cannot be entirely excluded. Okay, uh, Danny, what do you think of this case? So, forty-four-year-old overweight female with chronic right hip pain. Um, let's see. So, looks like there's the femoral head might. Yeah, we're, we're talking about the labrum, so oh, okay. uh, it's easier to look at a lot of different things here. But why don't you just concentrate on the labrum for this talk? Um. Oh, so maybe a tear of the. Uh, so we see, we see a little fluid here between the labrum and the bone, really at the chondrolabral junction. And the question is, is this a tear? Uh, now, in this particular image, it's really a, from the oblique axial images. This is a very far anterior here. And... Uh, And this is this is actually the area when we see look at other other images, and uh, this was a normal recess. And the typical normal recesses, which are commonly seen in the anterior inferior location, usually around the kind of the eight o'clock position, they're linear. They they look like partial separations, and then we don't have any surrounding abnormalities. So very far anterior and very far posteriorly. If I, if, if I see that, I'll usually just uh, either ignore it or describe it as uh, chondrolabral separation, most likely a normal recess. Okay, uh, Robert. All right, here looking at the hip, uh, anterior labrum, it looks like there's some irregularity and tearing at the base of the uh, anterior labrum. Yeah. Right through there. Mm -hmm. And this was a confirmed labral tear. The uh, the chondrolabral junction congenital defects or sulci or whatever term you, uh, you want to use for it uh, rarely occur in the anterior labrum. <clears throat> so if you see fluid extending uh, deep to the anterior labrum and the bone, it's most likely going to represent a tear. Uh, let's see, Taysen, what do you think of this one? All right, looks here in the anterior labrum, there's a tear with a little bit of separation there. Yeah, a little bit of fluid going a little bit external to the labrum itself also there. And this was a confirmed labral tear. Okay, uh, Danny. Let's see, at the superior or the anterior labrum, Looks like there's a little bit of fluid right here through the labrum, so suspicious for a tear. Okay. Uh, again, this is kind of anterior. Uh, posterior looks okay back here. So I, I always consider these with a little bit of suspicion, uh, but this was actually arthroscoped and actually was a tear. Uh, and it this is in a little different configuration. This actually looks like the fluid is going through the labrum itself rather than between the bone or the cartilage and the labrum, uh, which makes this a little bit more likely to represent an actual tear. Okay, uh, Robert? Okay, uh, let's see. You're looking at the uh, superior labrum. It looks like there's some irregularity on the left-sided image, and then is that a paralabral cyst extending superiorly on the right? right? Yeah. Yeah, here. Good. Mm -hmm. And then you can actually see the fluid going through the tear into the paralabral cyst. And then uh, other images, we can see that it extends anteriorly here as well with a large uh, adjacent cyst. Good. So with, with the cyst, you can feel very comfortable that you're dealing with an actual tear. Jason? Uh, All right, I guess we're looking at superior labrum. 
think there is a tear there with a paralabel cyst that right. you see better on this uh, sagittal view. Right. Good. Okay, Danny. Uh, looks like a paralabral cyst, but I don't definitively see a tear. Yeah. So uh, now this is a this is a situation where we really are not look, seeing the labrum very well, but we see a cyst that's immediately adjacent to that posterior labrum. We know the patient has sciatica. This is actually right by where the sciatic nerve goes. In fact, we can see it's coming right across here. And this, uh, this paralabral cyst is actually compressing the sciatic nerve, uh, producing sciatica. So these, fortunately, they're uncommon, but these posterior labral tears uh, can lead to uh, be one cause of sciatica uh, that you have to remember, compression of the sciatic nerve when it comes by here. Any history of trauma? Uh, not, I don't know. I don't know what the history is, John. Okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, Robert? Okay. Uh, let's see. The patient has uh, right hip pain. So, looking, I guess, along the uh, medial aspect of that medial acetabulum, it looks like there's a cystic structure in that upper image on the right. And it could be a paralabral cyst. But I don't so wanna... we see a cyst here. We can see the normal neurovascular structures on the left side, but we see a big cyst here obscuring the neurovascular structures. And this was also a ganglion, uh, which was compressing the nerve, producing muscular edema here uh, in the uh, the the muscles that that nerve goes to see the significant asymmetry within the muscles here on the axial PD fat set images and the edema and the atrophy on the affected side. Okay, uh, the uh, Tayson. Yeah, uh, I think this, this is a very old arthrogram. Yeah, posterior labrum looks like there's probably a tear there. Uh, yeah. Not quite linear like our other pictures of that sulcus. Right. And it, yeah, it's uh, the margins are not sharp. We don't really see fluid going into a typical sulcus. This is more increased signal intensity within the labrum, probably because it's abnormal labrum and, and the contrast is kind of oozing into the, the soft tissues of the labrum. Uh, uh, and, and this was a tear, even though there's no paralabral cyst. Okay, uh, Danny? Uh, so, it looks like left sciatica. Left sciatica. So, cyst kind of medial to the acetabulum, posterior medial to acetabulum, and maybe a extending from the yeah. paralabral area. Yeah, so here's the here the cyst, and right, this turned out, if you go back, you could, on one cut, you could follow it going back to the labrum, and these are actually some uh, partial volume of some of the fibers of the sciatic nerve coming right by that particular cyst uh, in that location, and here actually, here you can see you can follow the fluid back into the posterior labral tear uh, right here. Okay. And... Uh, Again, here's the sciatic nerve on that left side, and you can see where the cyst is compressing the nerve, producing sciatica in that location. Okay, Robert. All right, so we have history of right hip pain and rule out labral tear. Uh, looks like there's a right hip fusion, and on the uh, right-sided image, it does look like there's some irregularity of the... Uh, superior labrum, some fluid maybe undermining the labrum there. Yeah, it looks similar yeah. on the other side. Though. Yeah, it looks similar on the other side. Good. So here's what the, uh, this is an arthrogram, a small field of view. That's what you see here. 
here it looks like there's some more linear irregular signal extending superiorly. So I'd consider a tear or contralateral recess, I guess. Yeah, right. Yeah, I agree. We don't really see contrast definitely extending into that little uh, defect. And uh, this was arthroscoped, and they thought that this was a congenital uh, uh, nor congen a congenital chondrolabral uh, defect and not a tear. Uh, how come the patient had pain? But, Anybody determine it? Yes. Anybody want to comment why they might have right hip pain? I was just going to explain that. Okay, so that was normal. But if you look here on the uh, PD fat sat images, there's actually a tear of the iliotibial band right here, which was a source of this patient's pain. Uh, not the labral tear, but the iliotibial band tear. Okay. Uh, I don't remember. Who's next? Tayson, are you next? Yeah. Okay. So we have some marrow edema, femoral neck on the left. Uh, okay. Um, is that some irregularity of the transverse ligament? Yes, right. There's thickening and increased signaling tissue within the transverse ligament and some fluid adjacent to it. And a lot of irregularity here. So this was a patient who had trauma, had a trabecular bone injury, but also had a high-grade partial tear of the transverse ligament. It was treated conservatively, but at least by MR, we could make the diagnosis. Okay. Uh, uh, Danny? Yes, so it looks like right hip pain. Um, I do see some signal. The inferior labrum. Um, yeah, they're, they're, they're actually, I guess I didn't go through the anatomy. There really isn't an inferior labrum. Uh, the labrum uh, goes anteriorly, superiorly, and posteriorly, and then inferiorly, there's not really a labrum. There's a transverse ligament, which holds the uh, hip joint in place, uh, but there is no actually labrum going along the bottom uh, of the acetabulum. Okay, so and then a fusion uh, with, okay. I guess that would be the ligament then. What's this thing? Would that be the ligament you were mentioning? The ligamentum teres? No. The transverse ligament is this ligament here. Right. It goes between the anterior and posterior margins of the inferior acetabulum. Uh, this is something different. This actually goes up into the joint space and should attach to the fovea of the femoral head, we can see it's very thick in there, and this was a, a tear of the uh, ligamentum teri should come up and attach to the phobia. Here it's torn and displaced a little bit, so we see the end of the torn ligamentum teres, and we're at the wrong location to actually see the fovea of the, the femoral head, so this is torn and a little bit dis displaced. So this is a, a ligamentum teres tear. This is just a thick and balled up portion of the ligamentum teres and the joint space. Okay, uh, Robert. All right, so we have a 16 year old male with right hip pain and multiple prior negative MR arthrograms. Labrum looks okay. And there's some yeah, well, irregularity. Yeah, and the. the Ligamentum teres looks okay. This is the yeah. transverse ligament down here. Let me show some other images. There is some kind of thickening over here of the of the uh, ligament. Okay, so here we're going down here and we're starting to see a cyst inferiorly here. And then you can see a multi-septated cyst extending down here. And it's actually quite large. Okay, so is that a a tear of the ligamentum teres? 
Cysts. Yes, good. So this is one of the pathologies you can get with ligamentum tear is you can get a partial tear and then a, you can get a cyst that forms there. And sometimes these can be large and they can produce uh, uh, hip pain. John, you were going to say something? No, I, I was just going to say uh, uh, a good call. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Well, this was Dr. Dardashi's case. Okay, uh, Taysen. All right. Gradual anterior superior hip pain. So I think the labrum looks okay, as does the ligamentum teres. Is there something going on with the iliofemoral ligament there? Okay, so here's the iliofemoral ligament. Good. Uh, it looks like there's some fluid outside of it. It looks kind of buckled there and uh, abnormal, so the labrum is okay. Uh, here are other images. Here's the left side, and here's the right side. Yeah, it looks like the distal attachment of the iliofemoral ligament is torn. Good. Yeah. And then uh, this just shows an arthrogram appearance of that, of that tear. And here's an axial T2 showing the abnormal thickening and increased signal intensity within the iliofemoral ligament. Good. Okay. Uh, uh, Dan? Um, so it looks like fusion and then Sarah. Yeah, uh, this may be an arthrogram. Oh, um, so maybe the superior labrum has a little tear. Yeah, it looks like we have some uh, fluid going there. It looks kind of s separated, I agree. Uh, so the patient then had surgery, and this is, they had pain after surgery, and this is the post-op appearance after surgery. Okay, so some fluid at the location of the superior labrum. Um, I don't know if that's expected post-op. Um, okay, so uh, they went and did a, a arthroscopic uh, debridement, and they also debrided the iliofemoral ligament at this point, and this patient now had uh, instability uh, as a probable cause of their, of their pain. J John, do you want to comment about this surgery? Oh, well, uh... Iliofemoral ligament resection, that's that really weak, weakens your flexion ability. Uh, I don't know why they did that. You know, I tried to find out. I don't know why either, but I think... That, 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 that just doesn't make sense to me. Yeah. So this is, uh, yeah, post-operative. That, that, that's like... Uh, Cutting tissue without any um, good knowledge why why you're doing it. Yeah. Okay. Here's a patient who had left hip pain, uh, Robert. And this is really this is really the area of concern. Okay. Uh, so it looks like there's a little bit of cystic change there. Um, okay. And here's it. what the MR looks like. Yeah, the MRI shows some edema and cystic change there. So, this... so we see edema and cyst, and this is fairly common location for this. Uh, these are in the old days on plane films, we call these herniation pits or pits pits after a radiologist who was one of the people who described it. So uh, people have done a number of studies to, to look as to what causes these. Here's one in skeletal radiology where you can see they put the patient into the scanner. Uh, uh, here's uh, an area in the same location where you can see there's hibernation uh, of the uh, subcondral bone really at the superior head neck junction. And uh, uh, this, is, uh, this is when the patient had their leg down. This is in the splits position. And the splits position, you can see that area where you have the cyst is right up uh, uh, pressing against the, the anterior 
uh, labrum, anterior and the superior labrum in that location. So it's really thought that the herniation pits are typically located uh, in the anterior superior femoral head neck junction, right where you have a contact between the acetabulum and the uh, uh, femoral head neck junction. When people do the splits, there are a lot of sports activities where you hyperextend the hip uh, in, the, in the course of playing, especially with gymnasts and even hockey players and so forth. And these pits pits or herniation pits are probably due to chronic repetitive impaction injury at the extremes of motion uh, for physical activity. And now we know uh, after this that it's now believed in, in players who continue to do this kind of activity, especially hockey players, that over time this can irritate the bone and called hypertrophic bone formation. And we'll talk about femoral acetabular impingement, which is the outcome of that uh, either later in this talk or in the next talk. So here's some other examples, appearances of herniation pits. This is from a very old study on a low field scanner where we can see the typical indentation of these uh, herniation pits uh, due to uh, this mechanism of injury. Here, uh, let's see. Who's next? I forgot. It's me. Okay, go for it. We have a 12 year old female dancer. Looks like at the anterior femoral head neck junction, we have some edema and cystic change there. Right. Right into there. And again, we can see right in through here. So again, this is. This is that same area that we'll see in a little bit can develop hypertrophic bone formation. Uh, this patient is probably young. If they continue to dance like this, they'll probably end up getting hypertrophic bone formation and we'll end up with a camdap deformity that we'll talk about later. John, were you going to say something? Yeah, uh, if this, if this may be a beginning of a pit, but um, I would think that uh, that's a traumatic event. If you're a if you're a loser where your your collagen is looser than most, uh, you can get away with it. Uh, but I think if you're a stiffer, um, you've got problems doing this. So I, th I think there's some individuals that are capable of doing it without any injury. But there are some individuals that develop injury, and those are the ones that could, should quit doing it. Great. Uh, I, I I think if you're hurting yourself, um, you're a masochist if you're uh, if you continue with it. Yeah. Good. And uh, yeah, the question is: Is this a quick ask? Ask, ask Putin. He knows uh, somebody <laughs> that. Right. Ask who? Putin. Putin. Okay. He's right. married. He's married to uh, Olympic uh, right. gymnast. Right. Okay. I wonder how many pits she has. <laughs> that, oh, you don't have to answer that. Danny, are you next? Yeah. So similarly, you got uh, some bony edema at the anterior, like head and neck junction. Right. So it's probably this this same mechanism we see there. Good. Okay, hey, uh, Robert. All right. So we have a 33 year old with bilateral hip pain on exercise. Looks like there's some subchondral cystic change in the regularity of the anterior acetabulum, and looks like some femoral head and neck osteophytes there anteriorly as well. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And then here it looks like there's a bony protuberance at the anterior femoral head neck junction, so camp type morphology. Right. And so this is probably hypertrophic bone due to chronic repetitive traumatic injury. In this patient, we can also see that there's abnormality posteriorly and inferiorly here, where we have uh, cartilage narrowing, a lot of irregularity of subchondral bone, and some marginal osteophytes. This is the typical appearance that we'll talk about for. Uh, pincer type impingement. And so most of these uh, players end up coming in if they do have uh, uh, femoral acetabular impingement. It's usually a mixed forum 
of both the cam type, which we see anteriorly here, and the pincer type that we'll talk about later as well. Uh, so this is very characteristic appearance of uh, FAI that we're going to talk about in more detail. If I was going to guess, I think that's a female. I don't know. You might be right. Okay, so femoral acetabular impingement, it's really due to repetitive trauma, typically with extremes of flexion and internal rotation. Uh, it can also be due to abnormal shapes of the femoral head and neck, but it's usually due to rep repetitive overuse, impaction injuries at the extremes of uh, motion of the hip. Uh, you could, it, you know, that repetitive trauma leads to bony reactive change, hypertrophic bone formation, cartilage injury, and uh, degenerative subcondropotent disease. And then we'll talk about a CAM and pincer type. Uh, <clears throat> so femoral acetabular impingement, it can be due to pincer type, which is usually due to overcoverage of the uh, uh, of the acetabulum. Uh, <clears throat> uh, it could be due to congenital anomalies where the acetabulum is just too large. We'll we'll show examples of that in a minute. Or it can be due to uh, protrusional acetabula, uh, where the uh, femoral, femoral head extends too far into the acetabulum, usually with some sort of metabolic bone disease uh, as a cause of that. And then the CAM type uh, is really due to this osseous bump, which is usually anteriorly or anterior superior at the head neck junction. Uh, if it's superior, it can lead to pistol grip deformity that we'll talk about. Anterior superior is, uh, I think, a little bit more common. Uh, <clears throat> so here's just kind of a uh, configuration from a journal uh, article in, in AJR. Uh, <clears throat> it just shows that extreme information, uh, extreme degrees of, of uh, positioning of the femoral head and the acetabulum. You can get impaction like we saw those images at the head neck junction, usually anteriorly or anterior superiorly. Uh, if you have over coverage where the acetabulum is too deep, then what happens is you get leveraging where the acetabulum will impinge more on the neck of the anterior uh, junction and you actually end up forcing the head posteriorly back against the posterior glenoid and labrum, uh, producing erosion of the articular cartilage back here posteriorly and inferiorly. And over time, you can then develop hypertrophic bone formation really at the anterior superior head neck junction. So you can actually have both in, in the same hip. Yeah, most, most athletes who develop this will have a combination of both. And then there are a bunch of different clinical tests that we won't go through here. And then there's some x-ray signs which, as I'll point out in a minute, really aren't very accurate. Uh, normally, if you follow along the anterior acetabulum and then the posterior acetabulum, they don't really overlap. Uh, if you have retroversion of the acetabulum, then so what happens is you get a figure of eight sign where the anterior uh, and the posterior uh, rim of the, of the acetabulum uh, uh, but, but become abnormal, and, and you get this more figure of an eight type sign here due to the retroversion of the superior acetabulum. Mm -hmm. So here would be the anterior acetabulum, posterior acetabulum, but if you get a rotation so that you get retroversion of the acetabulum, then the anterior can come back here, and, uh, and then posterior here, so you get kind of a figure of eight sign. But I think I have some, you have to be very careful that you position, especially if you have asymmetry in those findings, then you really have to position, make sure that the pelvic is positioned with, with no rotation. And that can be difficult. Uh, a little bit more accurate way of evaluating this is actually with CT, uh, where normally the anterior acetabulum should be medial to the posterior acetabulum. And here we can see that the anterior acetabulum is more anterior uh, with actually a four degrees of, uh, in this case, uh, retroversion of the posterior aspect. Uh, I'm sorry. In this case, it would be antiverted because it's uh, uh, normally the, you should have about uh, 
15 degrees uh, here, and then in this particular case, the, the anterior acetabulum is too far lateral. And the 3Ds can be very helpful. This is commonly a location where you'll have hypertrophic bone formation, uh, which would, will uh, be a cause of impingement. Okay, and then here on the axial images, we can see the anterior bump here, typical of a cam type morphology. So that one had mixed impingement. So here we can actually see a superior bump. The superior bump changes the configuration of the head so that if you if you think of this as the uh, the the butt of a pistol, and this would be the uh, the body of the pistol and the uh, barrel of the pistol would go inferiorly here. Uh, the, this has an appearance that looks like uh, old Derringers uh, from the old movies. Uh, <clears throat> And this is called a pistol grip deformity, where you see this hypertrophic bone here superiorly involving the head neck junction. This, <laughs> if you use pistols, that's not a very good grip. Yeah, <laughs> right. Uh, now, a lot of these is now a lot of the pistol grip deformities can actually be due to old uh, uh, sip capital femoral epiphysis, uh, where you can get hypertrophic bone at the healing between uh, where the slippage occurs. So one of the differentials when you see a pistol grip deformity uh, would be old slip capital femoral epiphysis, and th that's actually one of the potential causes of cam type impingement. So that, that would mean that uh, more males will, will have the condition than females. I think that's true. Yep. Well, so a, a third of the Females uh, develop it. Two thirds are male. Okay. Slips. Yep. Okay. Now, uh, another way of trying to evaluate this, uh, this was originally on x rays, then it was used with CT and then with uh, MRI, is measuring something called an alpha angle. Where in this particular, in the, in this particular case, in the frog leg view, you can. Uh, uh, draw a circle where the femoral head is located here. You can draw a line that goes right along the bisects the anterior and posterior cortices of the neck, uh, but extends to the center of the circle. And then if you go around the circle to see where the circle and the bone uh, cross, uh, which would be right here, here's the neck coming in, and then there's the cortex. Uh, <clears throat> This, this angle made between these two lines is called the alpha angle. Uh, and we'll, we'll come back to what's normal and abnormal the alpha angle uh, a little bit later. Other signs that you can see that you can look for uh, would be having a, a pistol grip deformity here, which we can see very nicely, as well as a secondary ossicle or uh, Os acetabuli in this location, which is probably due to a fracture from uh, repetitive trauma. Okay. <clears throat> now, so, something else that, uh, that people try to look for, this is really uh, one of the reasons why in, uh, uh, when we do uh, imaging for hip replacements and knee replaces, the degree of rotation of the, uh, the femoral shaft is very important. Uh, so you can actually measure the, the torsion angle uh, between the, the proximal femur and the distal femur. I don't want to go into this uh, too much uh, because uh, we don't routinely measure this. At least I don't. I don't know anyone who routinely measured this in looking for impingement. But uh, go on. now, uh, another form of uh, torsion angle really is, uh, which we already have talked about, is looking at the angle between uh, a line that biceps the uh, epiphysis and a line that uh, goes right along the femoral head. 
Um, this is uh, the, the line that we use to evaluate for slip capital femoral epiphysis, uh, where normally these should be collinear. And if you have a epiphysis that slips, it tips, tends to slip downward like we saw before. And uh, as it slips more and more, this uh, uh, visual torsion angle increases in size. And the uh, normal degree is less than a 20 degree angle. So now if we, if we look at these abnormalities that you can measure on plain film, how useful are they in actually evaluating patients uh, with pathology? Well, uh, this is a study where they looked at 874 males, 1,207 females. They looked at patients with cam type impingement. They found uh, pistol grip deformity was uh, uh, commonly seen in males, but not so much in females. The uh, femoral neck bump was less commonly seen, but still again more in males. The lateral head flattening was uh, also fairly commonly seen with pincher type impingement. You have the uh, the uh, crossover sign in about 50% of uh, males and similar amount in females. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, th these were measurements made in asymptomatic individuals. I, I apologize. These are the measurements uh, typically done to evaluate for cam-type impingement, and these are the ones done for, for uh, pincer-type impingement. And it's what this study found is that the radiographic findings of FAI are commonly seen in asymptomatic young adults and uh, are probably not helpful in actually making the diagnosis. And though uh, people still talk about it, uh, almost everyone now goes to cross-sectional imaging to, uh, to evaluate these rather than using plain films. Can you bring that uh, back again, John? Yes. Oh, okay. The males is 21.5%, pistol grip, and females 3.3. I think that's because of the slips. Yeah, and again, these are in asymptomatic individuals, but you're probably right. There are probably quite a few people who get small slips who uh, are not symptomatic, and therefore you would have a tendency to overcall disease. And the crossover sign, as you can see here, is seen in about 50% of asymptomatic both men and women. So uh, these signs really aren't, uh, on on plain films are not really very helpful. So they're basically said that CT findings of FAI are kind of equally prevalent in young and old asymptomatic subjects who do not have osteoarthritis. So they say in this particular case that uh, their findings don't really support a role of FAI as a predisposing factor toward osteoarthritis and not to diagnosis FAI on imaging alone. And uh, and that also that you really can't use imaging alone to base doing surgery. The surgery still has to be based upon the, the, the clinical findings and the symptoms of the patients. So we need to be careful not to over estimate the value of imaging and uh, femoral acetabular impingement. Okay. Oh, I... Now, the, this is another study where they looked at uh, MRI and looked at findings on an MRI report. And uh, this particular group really felt that if you're looking for FAI, the things that you need to evaluate are acetabular version, uh, acetabular coverage, uh, labrum. Now, we talked a little bit about acetabular coverage at the beginning of all these of these talks when we talked about the center edge angle, uh, uh, which I think is still a very val uh, valuable measurement. Uh, and then acetabular version, uh, if you uh, can be done by either MR or CT, but it's usually if you're evaluating for FAI, CT is usually the technique of choice. And, and, uh, and so forth. And then 
And then also you need to look for the labrum because often with FAI, one of the things that occurs is you'll get injury to the anterior superior labrum uh, due to the impingement. You also articular cartilage injuries. You need to look at the head neck deform uh, junction morphology, the surrounding soft tissues, and for bone marrow edema and cystic changes. Uh, so again, <coughs> kind of reviewing this, for a cam tap impingement, you look for a femoral neck bump and an abnormal alpha angle uh, and anterolateral vestibular labral and bone injuries. Treatment is typically a bump resection. Uh, and again, you're really interested in this predominantly in the, young, in the younger uh, athletes. Uh, and then uh, you can do a bump resection. Uh, in the past, people would do a, a resection of the labrum. Uh, now the studies have shown that it's much better to do a labral repair rather than a labral debridement. So labral debridements are now kind of considered uh, uh, not appropriate. And then if you have a lot of cartilage disease, you can do microfracture. Or now, as we've done in the knee, people are starting to use more sophisticated uh, techniques uh, such as osteochondral repairs that uh, I think we talked about in the and the cartilage section and the cartilage talk. So uh, typically with MR, we'll evaluate alpha angle. Uh, we hear the coronal images. We take the oblique axial images, which are along the the, the length of the uh, femoral neck. Uh, this is the kind of image we get. Then we draw a line down the midline of the neck to the center and then uh, measure the, the alpha angle. Uh, and there, originally, it was felt that normal should be less than 55 degrees. Then people started finding that at 55 and 60 and 65 degrees that they're getting a lot of false positives. So now I think most people will kind of use a cutoff of 65 degrees. And there, there are many centers that do a lot of hip surgery right now who no longer use the alpha angle in their clinical decision-making. And that would be an abnormal alpha angle with a large bump here. So typically, when I look at, at studies, I'll, uh, uh, I'll kind of look at it. And if the morphology looks normal, I'll just say that's a normal alpha angle. But if I see a bump like this and a distortion, I'll go ahead and measure it and give the alpha angle. And this is in 2012, they increased that to 60 degrees, and now many people are using 65 degrees. It's a T1 oblique uh, axial images, which we can see here showing the, the femoral head. <coughs> I think I've already shown this before. Here's one where the image quality is very poor, but if you look at this, the reason is that we have flow artifact coming from phase artifact from the from the vessels here. So if we change the, the phase encoded direction to anterior and posterior on the PD fat sets, we can get good quality images. So now we like to do uh, uh, the oblique axial PD fat sat images so we can look for bone edema, but you just have to make sure that the phase encoding is anterior posterior, not right to left. And I think why don't we stop here, and we'll uh, we'll continue talking about uh, looking at some of the pathologic cases uh, tomorrow. Any questions? So does does that mean that these cam deformities, none of them are actually congenital? They're all just secondary to some sort of microtrauma or. Some of, them, some of them may be congenital, but the vast majority are thought to be secondary due to trauma, either a slip capital femoral epiphysis or a repetitive impaction injury. Most of them are probably repetitive impaction injuries. Okay. I think what you have to do is go back to the history. And if, and if the child didn't have any complaints and the teenager didn't have a complaints, and then you get to the older age group in the 40s and so on, but then, then, then you can make a, uh, 
diagnosis as to what Acquire. caused it, but yeah. otherwise you're, you can't do it. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Have a good one, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.